Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Movie Battleground. Today, we've got a matchup between two big heavy hitters. So sit back and uh, relax. Get ready for a big fight. Uh, let's introduce first introduce our fighters. My, well, let me introduce myself first. My name is Kirk Kolkowski. I'll be your host and uh, lead judge tonight. Uh, but let's go right into our two fighters. Uh, first, coming in with a Movie ground, uh, Battleground record of one win and zero losses, we have James the Gator White. James, how you feeling tonight? Oh, man, it's always fun to be on here with you guys. Um, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling uh, apprehensive at the same time. I know Brian knows his stuff, so it's going to be a fun match. We've had uh, run-ins in the past, so this is take three. And uh, see if I can finally get on the win column against Brian Michaels here. All right. And his opponent, as he already mentioned, a gentleman I'm, I've become familiar with in the uh, trivia realm of things, but... This is my first exposure to him in Battleground. I'm excited to see how he does. With a record also of one win and zero losses, it's Brian the MacGuffin Michaels. Brian, I know you've had a busy evening. You ready for tonight's matchup? Uh, ready as I'm going to be. I mean, like James said, we've, we've, we've got a history, but I, everything we've ever done has been so close, and this is not going to be any different because he knows his stuff. I've seen him. I was actually a judge in his last debate, and it's, uh, it's going to be a slugfest, so. We'll have fun. Absolutely. Got some great great questions tonight. And thankfully, I don't have to make the decisions on my own. I have two great judges with me. First, we have uh, joining us Dan Skip Allen. Dan, how are you feeling about tonight's matchup? Hey, you know, I'm glad to be back. I, I took some time off. I've been busy uh, going to uh, a lot of press screenings and things like that. And uh, these guys were the judges at my match. So how ironic is it now I get to judge <laughs> match with them? No, he just wants revenge. Okay. Well, time for a little payback. And re rounding out tonight's judges bench is Max Vincent. Max, how you feeling? You feel good about tonight's fight? Yeah, uh, we'll see what happens. I think it's going to be a great match. And I'm looking forward to judge for the very first time. So we'll see what happens. Awesome. Absolutely. <coughs> okay, guys, before we get into the questions, let me go over the, the rules real quick. Uh, we're going to have three first-round questions, and then we'll do the speed round if necessary. Uh, for our first three questions, you'll both be given uh, one minute to uh, give your opening statements. We'll have five minutes of uh, general debate time, and then once those five minutes are up, you will each get uh, one minute to close. And gentlemen, are you ready? Let's go. We are. All right. Okay, first question. All the uh, boring business stuff with 20th Century Fox and Disney is done now, and the important thing is that the X-Men have come home officially to the MCU, which means one thing, reboot. Your first task tonight, gentlemen, with your first question is to pitch an MCU X-Men reboot film. And you have the option to either stick with the cur current cast, cast new, uh, new actors, or... A mixture of both. So, uh, James, why don't we start with you on this one? Uh, what direction are you taking the X-Men from here on out in the MCU? Would you get a longer opening for the pitch, right? Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, Max is keeping time for us tonight. Max, yeah. uh, because this is going to take a little longer, give them two minutes on their first okay, uh, so opening. Okay. Yeah, Brian. yeah. Thank you, Brian. So, the way that I see it is that we need to bring the X-Men into the MCU and have a completely fresh start. Um, what they did with Fox was great at times. It was terrible at times. So what we need to do is we need to clean the slate, start from scratch. And I see a, a person directing this that has worked with ensembles before, that has done action before, that has a sense of some comedy that you need. And that person is Steven Soderbergh. Um, Steven Soderbergh, when he directs the Oceans movies, when he directs things like that, he's able to bring in all these A-list stars and have them... Um, kind of work off of each other. You don't have anybody pushed to the wayside. Everybody is able to to get their, their moment to shine, which in the X-Men film you need. Everybody has to be able to get this give and take. You need a little bit of everybody. Um, and he's able to do things um, action-wise that, that really sets up with the X-Men. What, what he was able to do um, last year with Unsane, working off just the iPhone, um, that was a great action movie. Um, and he, he's going to be able to take uh, an ensemble cast like this and really elevate it. So what I see going on is uh, you have Professor X and Magneto um, as Colin Firth for Professor X, and you have Gary Oldman as Magneto. Uh, Gary Oldman um, does such great work as a villain, and he would be able to sink his teeth into a role like this. I could see him kind of going over the top with it, but also subdued. Um, and Colin Firth just has that reassuring 
um, gravitas that, that you need with Professor X. You need somebody that, that has that, um, that weight behind their speeches. And Colin Firth is a perfect example of somebody like this. Um, I, I don't want to have a huge X-Men cast. I think for the first movie, it needs to be smaller cast. So I see the main being uh, Cyclops, Jean Grey, and Storm. Um, for Cyclops, I'm thinking uh, Sean, uh, or Chris Pine. Chris Pine, bring in the final Chris. You get all the Chris's into the MCU now. Chris Pine um, would, would bring that leadership and that toughness you need with Cyclops, but he's also um, a, a very reserved character, so he would have that vulnerability you need with, with uh, Scott Summers. Um, and Jean Grey, I'm seeing, is uh, Catherine Watterson. You'll know her from the Fantastic Beast movies. She plays Tina in the Fantastic Beast movies. And um, for uh, Storm, I'm looking at Issa Rae. Issa Rae, she was fantastic in The Hate You Give and um, a lot of these other smaller films. So um, that's my main right, cast. Time. I'll get into the uh, Thumbs up. pitch. That's time. Thank you, Max. Thank you, James. And uh, Brian, let's move over on to you. Uh, we'll start your time whenever you start talking. Uh, give us your X-Men MCU pitch. Okay, so the big question with bringing the X-Men into the MCU is you got to figure out how to introduce them. I mean, where were these characters during all the previous uh, events that happened in the MCU? You know, why weren't they there and why weren't they involved? Because these things, if they were around, you'd think they would have been involved. Um, my movie's going to tell the story of not only where they were, but how the events of Infinity and Endgame are what prompted them to finally decide to go public and join in the fray. Um, the truth is the mutants have been around the whole time. But while there were superhuman people with superhuman abilities around with, with the Avengers, it was all like uh, Iron Man and, and, and Captain America who were made by technology or through science. Um, even the Hulk happened through science and, and all these things happened. But people who are born mutants are still feared and considered freaks, or at least they think they will be. So they're staying in hiding. Um, Charles Xavier, who in my movie is uh, played by Mark Strong, um, he has had this school for gifted youngsters, which is, that's the front of the, of the thing, but he, um, it's not just gifted youngsters, like mentally or, or intelligence wise. Um, these are people he is getting finding and gathering mutants to come to his school where they can live in peacefully. They don't have to live in fear. They can uh, live their lives with people like themselves. Um, now, by the time Infinity War and Endgame, those events happened. Um, I think he realizes that the the gravity of the the challenges and, and that are out there, and they it's their responsibility that they need to use their abilities to get involved. So he takes his uh, some of his teachers and his elder students and forms the X Men and decides that they are going to help it, help defend the world basically and get involved in these fights. Um, so you'll see the team form. You'll see the danger room. Uh, Magneto, who is played in mind by Jason Isaacs. Um, Magneto has kind of the opposite ideology from Charles Xavier in that he does see these superhuman people becoming more prominent, but he thinks that this is the time for them to rise up and take over because they are the next stage in evolution. Um, it's time. So and it's time. Okay. All right. So we'll uh, we'll let you finish your cast there in the uh, in the general uh, battleground yep. here. Uh, so guys, good. You have five. And also remember, I forgot to mention, if you'd like, you have, for one of the three questions, you do have the option to extend the time to from five minutes to six minutes. If other of you would like to do that now, you may say so. Otherwise, we'll start the five minutes now. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to start five minutes just by uh, throwing out my cast for you so you know what we're talking about. Um, I already said Jason Isaacs and Mark Strong. I have Joseph, Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Cyclops. Saoirse Ronan as Jean Grey. Uh, Naomi Harris, you, you might know as the new Money Penny, also Calypso, or she's most recently in Rampage as Storm. Zoe Dutch as Kitty Pride, and Army Hammer as Colossus, though he'll be done in CGI like in Deadpool when he is uh, when he is in his metal form. Um, as far as as far as, as as your film, James, I think that Soderbergh's a good director. I don't know if he's right for this. I mean, he, the most action he's directed has been like a heists in things like the Oceans films. Um, and he did Haywire, but in there he was, you know, directing an MMA star who could do action in Gina Carano. He wasn't dealing with Issa Rae and uh, uh, who was it, Catherine Waterston, who to me just always has a confused look on her face all the time. I think that my director, uh, who I don't think I mentioned, is Christopher McQuarrie. He obviously can handle action, and he can handle dialogue and characters and story. He's really proven himself in the Mission Impossible films as well as his other films. Look, and I think he's perfect. Can handle action. Soderbergh can handle action. He's done it before. He's done it in the past. And Catherine Watterson has has this look on her face, but that's kind of what you need with Jean Grey. Jean Grey 
is is a conflicted character. She's a very conflicted character, but she has this presence. Um, when you when you see Catherine Waterston appear in in Fantastic Beasts, she's she's very proper and she's uptight. And she has this confidence about her. Um, but Joseph Gordon Levitt as Cyclops just does not fit with me. Um, he's such a a strange casting choice there for me. You need somebody that's going to have leadership and somebody that's going to be able to lead this team. And I don't see Joseph Gordon Levitt as a as a leader like I would see with Chris Pine. Chris Pine is is a much stronger force. You need somebody that's going to be able to lead these people. Chris Pine has proven with Star Trek. He's proven with Wonder Woman that he, that he has that. But he's he's such a an internalized actor. Just going from Hell or High Water, what he was able to to do with Hell or High Water and and all the nuance that he brings to it, I think he's a much better choice for a character like Cyclops. But getting getting to um to my story, it's it's actually a similar story to you to where the X Men are. You know, they they have been around, and these events are are kind of bringing them out of their shell. But the the thing that that I I want to um kind of elaborate on is is uh, Gary Oldman for for Magneto because Gary Oldman, um, the power that he's able to bring behind all of his performances. I mean, whether it be in something um, uh, like Hannibal or or what you see in The Fifth Element, um, he's going to be able to bring Magneto to to that upper echelon that you're really going to need for somebody with a villain of that stature. So I think Jason Isaacs has proven himself. As I mean, not only in the Harry Potter films, but in the Patriot and so many other things where he's been kind of a villainous role. But he's also intelligent. You can see behind his eyes that you know he, Gary he believes in what he's fighting for. I, I'm not saying Gary Oldman's not intelligent. <laughs> just like with your Chris Pine pick, I think Chris Pine is actually the strongest part of your pitch. But I still just don't think he's he's right for this. Um, partially because if you add one more Chris to the MCU, the universe is going to implode. You're going to have no, like, all we, four of the Chris's in there. We need <laughs> all the Chris's in the MCU. We need all of them in, and then you have them all together. We can finally decide who is the best Chris for once and for the all. Marvel Chris you universe. All in there. Yeah. Exactly. Um, That's what the MCU is. Yeah, but see, I, I just don't think, especially, and, and you have such a small, I understand you need a smaller, smaller group, because the X-Men is, has so many characters. Um, I have, I think, like, besides uh, Professor X, I think I have like six characters in mind, but you have limited to three, which I think is just too small for X-Men. If you're going to do that, you might as well just have them start in solo films. I'm not saying this is going to be my only cast. Um, I'm, I'm not going to list 15 different X-Men. I, I had an idea for three or four. I thought Millie Bobby Brown maybe coming in as Jubilee, um, things like that, and actually I wanted to do a a little tease at the very end that you're going to bring Wolverine in for a sequel, but it's going to be Scott Kahn coming in as Wolverine. Nice, smaller guy. He can get stocky. He's got the comedic element that you need for a Wolverine, but it wouldn't be anything as a major cast. Um, the, you need a smaller group to introduce these characters, and then in the sequel, you can expand it, and you can expand it some more. But we need to know who these characters are to begin with. We can't have an overload. If you throw 15 or 8 characters at it, then it just becomes an overload. I will say that this is part of the problem in debating you is I think we have very similar ideas. <laughs> like you said, the whole main story is kind of the same idea. And I as well had uh, the, in the closing credits or the post credit sequence, I was going to have uh, Professor X arriving in Canada and find, you know, Wolf, basically he's looking for Wolverine. And Wolverine turns out to be Luke Evans, who was people might know from right through everything from Dracula Untold to some of the Fast and the Furious movies. Um, so in that respect, I think we're on the same wavelength there. Um, but I, I just think that this movie is going to need more action than Steven Soberg has experience with. I mean, I, I don't see Unsane as an example of action, especially it being shot on an iPhone. It shows he's experimental, but that's not what X-Men needs. This is the MCU. They All have right, their uh, own way there? of doing things, and things are big. Uh, time's up. Sorry. Okay. Guys, that is time. So we will go now to your um, closing arguments. Uh, James, we'll start with you again. Uh, you got one, we'll give you one minute here to wrap up your, uh, your final thoughts. The X-Men doesn't need to be a huge over the top action film. It doesn't need to be guardians of the galaxy blowing up in space and things like that. You don't need all that, that over the top action. Um, Steven Soderbergh is going to be able to get enough action in his, you don't need helicopter chases and things like this. It can be a, an ensemble character piece between Magneto and professor X and the smaller group of X-Men. It doesn't need to be something huge. So Soderbergh would be able to be fine. It doesn't It doesn't matter that he doesn't do huge over-the-top action movies like Macquarie does. Macquarie's a, an okay director with action stuff, but he doesn't get the dialogue and, and things like that like like Soderbergh would be able to do. I don't believe that he has a, the, the same uh, repertoire there. I, th I think I have a stronger cast. Um, I, I really like um, my Cyclops. I love Colin Firth. 
what he's able to to bring to that role of a nice reserved British man that that has uh, gravitas behind his words that he's going to be able to gain uh, respect and followers. And Gary Oldman has the charisma that you believe that people would follow him right. um, onto this this journey. Okay, um, then we'll go over to Brian. And uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and wrap things up with your final minute? Okay. Uh, first of all, Christopher McCory is perfect, not only to direct this, but to write it. I mean, he, he does have excellent dialogue. The man wrote Usual Suspects, which is basically nothing but dialogue, and that is a great movie, in addition to Way of the Gun and several other movies. Um, but I think my movie is, is, I think it's a more well-rounded movie. You've told us about Steven Soderbergh and his style, and how he's gonna, but you haven't told us much about the plot. And I think what's important is how they're going to incorporate this into the MCU. And like I said, with telling where they've been, what they've been up to, how, how these mutants finally felt that they were going to come out and enter the fray and become part of the open world, despite if they're going to be feared by people, which is going to be a major conflict in the movie. And then you got Magneto. It's going to take some of these mutants that are coming out of hiding, and they're all choosing sides. So it's going to be basically good mutants versus quote-unquote bad mutants, and that's going to create a whole new universe for the MCU to cover. I'm good. All right, guys, a lot, of chew, right. a lot to chew on there, a lot to digest. Uh, personally, I'd like to see at least bits and pieces of both these movies. Uh, so a uh, lot going on here. Dan, I hate to do it to you, but I'm going to come to you first. Uh, out of these two pitches, which one would you rather see? Which, who are you going to give the point to here? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I, I get to give credit to both of these guys. They both did a great job um, talking about their film, but also attacking, doing enough – uh, just enough attacking of the other person's film. This is a very hard decision for me. Um, but I feel like the the last little point that Brian made about talking about the plot and talking about where wh where the writing process would go and how you would tell a story regarding um, James's pitch. And I love James, Gary Oldman. Colin Firth, Chris Pine, Issa Rae, Catherine Waterston. Great cast that he's chosen. But like Brian said, he didn't talk enough about the story, how these characters would find their way. They both said the same thing at the beginning. They, they existed and they would all come out of hiding. But that's not talking enough about the plot and how would you – introduce them into the MCU besides oh they were hiding and they came out. But Brian made did enough of attacking that point for um James and James in my opinion just was messing around with talking about his cast and all this stuff. So I give the slightest of edges because of Brian attacking uh the fact that James didn't bring up a plot and the story where he would go with the story. Uh so I'm gonna give my Point to Brian on that, but All very right. slim, slim margin. Gotcha. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Max, we'll go to you next. Uh, which direction are you going on this, with this fight? Okay, well, this is a very interesting, uh, interesting question to answer. Uh, a lot of good points made from uh, James and Brian, but uh, I think that I will give the the point to Brian because uh, it was a, it was much more convincing. Uh, you know, with the Christopher McQuarrie, with the strong cast that he had, but also the plot is really what made. Same thing with Dan. Uh, he talked more about the plot, and you know, as what, what James said, you know, it's, it's great. Steven Soderbergh, Colin Firth, Gary Oldman would be great uh, as Magneto, I believe. But the really what sold me is the plot, the the, the way that uh, the X Men would be integrated in the MCU, directed by Christopher McQuarrie with a really strong cast. So. I'll give it to Brian. Brian gets a point on question number one. Okay, uh, question number two. Whew. So glad I got to be uh, lead judge for this question, guys. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the question number two is name the worst ever whitewash casting in a motion picture. And uh, Brian, this time we'll we'll start with you. Uh, why don't you uh, we'll do your one minute opening uh, argument. Who do you say is the uh, worst example of whitewash caching in the history of cinema? Okay. Well, I hate debating the worst of things because I prefer to look at the positives in film. But but this is the subject we, we dealt with, and there's only one answer to this, 
and that is Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, I mean, the character of, of Mr. Yunioshi, the photographer who lives upstairs, existed in the novel. And it, there may have been a, a few things about it that weren't right. But then in, in the film, they cast Mickey Rooney, the whitest man in America at the time. And then on top of that, they gave him an exaggerated buck teeth. They gave him squinty eyes, cartoonishly large glasses. They had him act like some kind of character out of a Bugs Bunny cartoon propaganda World War II movie. And just insulted everybody in an entire race. I mean, th- there's nothing defensible about this. It was just the worst case of whitewashing that you could have to not only make someone white into an Asian, but to do it in such an racist, offensive way. All right. Okay, that's uh, Brian's opener. James, uh, what's your choice for this uh, controversial topic? Worst uh, example of whitewashing in movies. Yeah, um, Mickey Rooney is a very racist character in Breakfast Activities, absolutely. But being a whitewashed character is more than just being a racist depiction of a character. Um, whereas it's it's insulting a, a race, it's, it's pretending to be a race and not an over-the-top caricature. And I'm picking Fisher Stevens in the short circuit film. You're looking at a white man depicting an Indian uh, Indian person and and also doing a, a racist um, depiction of this with a uh, fake accent and things like that. Um, you're, you're talking about a, a, the Mr. Yunioshi character. He was in the book. So, I mean, yes, there he's in the book. Did they cast the wrong person? Probably. But you're looking at a character that was written for the film as an Indian man, and they don't even cast an Indian in this role. It was written for this particular film. They had the book to go on with Mr. Yunioshi. They chose to put in star power, which is a lot of times what they did in the 50s and 60s. You look at Genghis Khan, uh, portrayed by John Wayne in 1956. And time. That's your one minute. All right, guys, let's get ready to dive into this. But before we do, I think it's important to po- point out here, uh, as we're watching uh, five white dudes talk about whitewashing, uh, <laughs> it's very important to point out here that as our competitors argue for why their uh, selection is the worst, I don't think either of them are saying that the other one is okay or that oh, it's uh, not offensive. Not. <laughs> I just want to put that, I don't want to make you guys waste use your time up to say that because I'm sure you're feeling that way. Just want to put that disclaimer out there before we start. So, do either of you want to use your six minutes on this one? Um, I'm okay with just the regular time. Uh, that's what I figured. Okay, we'll start to five minutes whenever you guys go. Look, Mr. Yunioshi is is a terrible depiction of a Japanese American, but it is of its time and it's emblematic of what was going on in the 50s and 60s you speak about the bugs bunny cartoons and you think uh you speak about all these things genghis khan like i said portrayed by john wayne just a few years earlier 1961 was a terrible time in america for for racial uh, equality and this is just an example of it it's a bad example but it's an example of it my film came out in 1986 and then it followed it up with a sequel two le- two years later you're talking about 25 years they couldn't learn their lesson and then they're like screw it let's make another one and we'll even make him the bigger star in the sequel but you're saying it's a product of its time. That doesn't make it any less offensive or more forgivable. I didn't say yes, it did. Yes, it was. But I mean, and the blackface back in Birth of a Nation isn't acceptable just because, oh, that was, or isn't less, of a, less offensive than, than Fisher Stevens in Short Circuit just because it was of its time. I mean, Fisher Stevens actually, I, I was looking into this, and Fisher Stevens did interviews, as well as some other people who were criticizing it, where they said that he actually had an Indian, uh, a pers- an Indian person on set because he did not want to do anything that was offensive. Yes, he was a comedic character. And yes, he should have. They should have cast an Indian character. But he took care when he did that that he didn't want to become a parody. That's the exact quote of his that I found in an interview. He didn't want to become parody. And so he had someone on set to, to let him know if he was crossing that line. Now, with Mr. Yunioshi, though, I mean, it, there was no effort at all to make it any less offensive of a stereotype. I mean, he, they actually went pushed as far as they could to go over the top, make it even more offensive. Yes, but like you said, in the Bugs Bunny cartoons and in the propaganda um, posters and things like that, it it was what they did in that time. They they did the buck teeth and they did the squinty eyes, and it's terrible. It's 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 a a black mark on on our history as as a society in America. But the the thing that that you have to realize is that we didn't learn a lesson over twenty five years. It's they they were like, oh well, that was offensive then, but let's just do it again. You know, we'll we'll just We'll paint them a little bit brown, paint them a little They didn't do it nearly as bad. Well, that's because the 
just because the actor had had the, the thought of mind saying, hey, I don't want to be um, be attacked for this role, so I'm going to try to bring it on and make it less offensive. It doesn't make it less offensive that they cast him that way. The actor might have done a good job, but the, the portrayal of the character is still a terrible decision by the production and by the executives. But at least he had a character. That character was a scientist. That character was the co-creator of Johnny Five the Robot in that movie. That character was imperative to the plot. My character exists as nothing but comic relief. He existed only to make people laugh at the stupidity of a Japanese character in this movie. They they gave the um they gave Fisher Stevens a lot of comic roles in there. There was lots of over the top things in in the short circuit series too. They made him the butt of jokes in the several scenes. So it's not just one note there. Um, but Mr. Uniori, like you said, he was in the book. He's a character that was already written. So it's not like they just made it up for the movie. And Breakfast at Tiffany's, even with that, is still considered to be a a iconic film. It's still one of the best films of all time. It's um, on dorm rooms everywhere for sorority girls everywhere. Um, but Short Circuit is is mostly forgettable. What you remember about Short Circuit anymore is, oh my God, they had a really, really terrible Indian character played by a white man. That's all anybody remembers about Short Circuit besides, oh, Johnny Five, I'm alive. It's, it's completely based on a whitewashed performance. Now, Breakfast at Tiffany's is not made a lesser film because of his character. Well, yes, but you, you keep talking about how, yes, the character was already in the novel, as if that, that makes it less uh, less whitewashing. But the fact is, yes, it was, a, it was a Japanese character in the novel, and when they brought it to screen, they put a white guy in it, as opposed to this role, like you said, they took a character that actually was originally supposed to be white in the early stage of the movie, and they later decided to make him Indian and asked the actor they'd already cast if he could do Indian. Now, does that make it okay? No, it doesn't. But when you took a character that existed in, in, in the novel and you said, no, we don't want a Japanese guy, we're going to put a white guy in there. So, yeah, that, that makes my point even stronger. I appreciate that, Brian. So they had a, written as a white character and they're like, well, what's going to be a better idea here? We need somebody smart that can make this robot. Let's make him an Indian guy. But we already cast a white guy, so what should we do? Oh, we'll just pretend he's Indian. No, that's way worse. At least they had a written uh, Japanese character, and they were like, well, we need a star in this movie, so we'll put Mickey Rooney in it, we'll make him look Japanese, we'll make him laugh, things like that. No, you, you wrote it as a white character, you needed somebody to, to, to stereotype it being, oh, a smart person has to be Indian to make this robot, so we're just going to make this white guy Indian. See, I, I, I disagree, because I, I think that the, the fact that they had an Indian and let him be an intelligent, it, not, not as a stereotype. Yeah, that's time, that's our five minutes, guys. All right. <laughs> you definitely giving us a lot to think about here. Um, so we will uh, conclude with our uh, final thoughts. And Brian, we'll start with you, uh, you this time with your final one minute closing. Okay. Um, I think nobody's going to argue that neither that either one of these was okay. They're both horrible examples of whitewashing roles. And yes, they were, they were cartoonish because they're, they're both in comedic roles. But the way I see it, there there are levels to whitewashing. There's there's a, a character that's supposed to be a, a, another race or minority in a movie, and they decide, no, let's put a white guy in that movie instead. That's one level. The next level is, we're going to keep that character as a minority, but we're going to cast a white guy as him, which is what happened in your movie. And then there's casting a white guy as the minority and making it a huge racist stereotype. And that's what mine did. It offended everyone who's seen it. When you look back on it, when they release new DVDs and Blu-rays and things, they even have to put on extra features of discussions about the idea of whitewashing and what this character was and try to put it in context at the time because they know how awful it was and how offensive it was to everyone who's ever seen this movie. All right, that's it. Okay. Um, then we will go to James. James, what are your final thoughts? They have to put disclaimers in front of a lot of things that happened in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that just is fact. We did a lot of terrible things back then. The fact that this movie was made in 1961, um, it's of its time that they would cast somebody that is a prominent star in order to elevate a film box office-wise. They put, like I said, John Wayne as Genghis Khan because he was a big star and they wanted people to go see this movie. Um, but they needed Mickey Rooney in that to sell box office tickets. It was terrible casting. I completely agree. It's offensive. But we're talking 25 to 30 years later, and you're using a white actor to play an Indian man when we know that it's offensive. They should have learned their lesson over that 25-year period. They had a white actor written. They had a white character written. They changed it 
for stereotype purposes to make it an Indian character because Indian's the only person that can make this machine, apparently. And then they left the white actor in, and it's offensive to um, to Indian actors. Um, it's offensive to to just everybody that right. they didn't do. Yeah, that's one minute. Okay, so now we need to decide which one of these is worse. So again, as us, as as we judges pick one, we're not endorsing the other. Please, please keep that in mind. And uh, Max, we're going to start with you and uh, see how you uh, which way you're leaning on this. Both very interesting. Um, both great arguments. It's very hard right now because, well, first of all, when I was a little kid, I watched Breakfast at Tiffany's and I laughed a lot at Mr. Yunioshi, um, which is not good at all. But whatever, I was a little kid. I didn't know better back then. Um, but uh, I really do have to agree with uh, Brian more because um, it's true that they – they really made fun of this, I don't know, Asian stereotype, you know, casting a white dude, putting him in this uh, bunch of makeup with the, with the cheeks, with the teeth is way more offensive, uh, in my opinion, than uh, what Fisher Stevens played in Short Circuit. Um, this, it was, I mean, it was really, really, uh, really bad. Uh, what they did uh, to uh, Mr. Yunioshi, Mickey Rooney. I, 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 when I was a kid, I, I thought it was funny, but it's definitely not. It's su superbly offensive. Uh, so, yeah, Brian had the better argument because uh, he really explained, you know, how it was offensive and, you know, how disrespectful the character was and um, how, you know, uh, like, like, like I said, how offensive it was to um, minorities at that time. And uh, so, yeah. I don't want to repeat myself, so that's my. Uh, gotcha. My All right. Okay. So that's that's. Uh, uh, thank you, Max. That's one for Brian. Um, I'll go next, and uh, I really thought you both did make great arguments, uh, like Max was saying. Um, you both had uh, two great picks. Um, personally, I think the right a uh, answer is uh, the guy that played Jesus in King of Kings. Uh, of all the white Jesus, he was the most white Jesus. So, uh, <laughs> but your your guys' pick was uh, picks were good too. Um, uh, Brian, you made some great points just about how mean spirited and ugly the character was. Uh, but James, you really punched back talking about how you know thirty years later we should learn something from that, and uh, you know should have at least uh, you know improved our understanding of how how to handle those things, and we did not. Uh, but again, I, I hate to make this uh, uh, less dramatic, but I'm going to give this one to Brian again, uh, just because I think uh, he argued more of the, uh, just like I said, how ugly the uh, Mickey Roy's portrayal was, how, how uh, mean-spirited almost it was. And um, the fact that he pointed out that uh, they did at least try with the short circuit character uh, to there was this, there's idea of sensitivity that didn't really exist with breakfast at Tiffany's. So uh, Brian, I'm going to give you the point on this one. Okay. So that's uh, two points for Brian now. And I can see by James's face, he doesn't agree with our uh, call on that, but that's all right. We got one more fight here to uh, uh, one more question here before we go to speed round, if necessary. Uh, so let's take a deep breath, cleanse our palate of that last argument for question number three. And that is, what is the best 80s action film? And I'll ask first, does anybody want to use their six minutes on this? Nah. All right. Okay, we'll do five minutes. And James, we'll start with you. Your one-minute opening uh, argument here for best 80s action film. All right. Not only is it one of the best 80s action films, it's also one of the best 80s adventure films, one of the best 80s sci-fi films, one of the best 80s horror films. It is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of the greatest films of all time, and it has so much going on. It is nonstop action, adventure, intrigue. Um, you have Harrison Ford just at the top of his game, coming off of an iconic character and giving you a second, which is almost impossible. You're known for one character for for just the prime of, of a career, and then you get to add a second one, a second iconic character right on top of it. Um, Raiders is able to, to give you strong performances from secondary characters, uh, really, really great villains. Um, it's got amazing set pieces, action, adventure, like I said, it is the best action movie of the 80s. Okay, that's your time. 
And uh, Brian, we'll go to you next. What's your what's your uh, pick for best '80s action film? One minute opener. Okay, anyone who's ever known me or seen any of my my random matches gonna come to no surprise to anyone. But my pick for the best '80s action movie is Die Hard. Die Hard is the gold standard by which action movies are measured now. There's so many movies try to be Die Hard, but it's often you know duplicated or often imitated, never duplicated. Um, it stands head and shoulders uh, above all other action movies. I mean, head, shoulders, torso, maybe even like mid-thigh. It's just that much better. And it was original at the time. Uh, it, it not only does it have great action, but it has great characters. It has great villain, one of the best villains of all time. This community alone not, voted him the best villain uh, in film like a couple weeks ago. Um, it's packed with action, yet it all serves the story. Uh, it's not just for action's sake. It's intelligent. Um, and, and also... If you're looking at the, what's the best 80s action film, this is a definite 80s film. I mean, the kind of characters, the kind of action, the quips, the one-liners. This is the, the question is, what's the best 80s action film? And this is definitively 80s. All right. All right. That's your one minute. So, gentlemen, uh, we've had your opening arguments. Best 80s action film. Let the battle begin. Before we go any further, I'm throwing that right back at you. We're not putting 80s in quotation marks. It's not best 80s action film. It's the best action film of the 80s. So don't try to say, oh, just because it had dude doing coke off of desk makes it more 80s than Raiders. So, look, you have a great villain. I have a great villain. But your your damsel in distress story is so weak. Marion Ravenwood is such a strong female character in Raiders. She's a badass. She kicks her own ass. She drinks people under the table. Whereas Holly Gennaro just sits cuddled up in a corner of the office waiting to be saved by her husband. But first of all, I, I think the question was, what is the best 80s action movie? And I think this is definitively 80s. But if you want to put that aside, we'll put that aside. Um, I'm, I'm just not saying that argue... quotation mark 80s. I'll take away the quotation mark. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to argue the quality of Raiders. Raiders is probably my one favorite film of all time above Die Hard. As far, if, you're talking just, if you're talking just best film of all time, I love Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm not going to argue the quality of it. It's won awards, and it deserved every one of them. Um, <laughs> But I also think that's more of an adventure film. There are act there's definitely action in this movie, but that is an adventure film. Action is a very specific category, and especially when you put 80s in front of it, whether you like it or not, 80s does have a style to it. And this is the best action movie of the 80s. Now, no, there's there's so much action going on in Raiders. Yes, there's adventure too, but it, there's there's so many action set pieces. I mean, you have the opening in the temple with all the stuff going off. Uh, shooting arrows at him you've got the um the huge uh, car chase at the end the fight with the um the airplane coming on there, there's so many action set pieces in that movie and it never misses a beat the uh the story never loses interest you never you never get sidetracked you know where you're going it's got uh just fantastic dialogue and just strong strong supporting characters the, the characters in Die Hard, aside from Hans Gruber and John McClane, are all forgettable. And maybe Al Pal and Argyle, I'll give you those two. But the the henchmen to, to uh, Gruber, I mean, they're forgettable. It's like, you don't remember any of those guys. You might remember a couple of their names, but, I mean, Carl. But nobody rem I tell you, you line up five guys and tell them which one of them is Carl. Nobody's going to be able to point out who Carl is. But you, you've got... Sala, and you've got Marion, and you've got Balak. I mean, all these great supporting characters in Raiders with fantastic action adventure, and the score is unbelievable. Play me the Die Hard score, and I would not tell you it's from Die Hard. Oh, see, I disagree. Die Hard score by Michael Kamen is actually one of the best action scores because it doesn't rely on these bombastic themes, which are great for a movie like Raiders. It's got that Saturday morning serial, but it ha it's the best movie that just, it, it, there's no main theme to Die Hard. It's just the music that supports the film, and Michael Kamen did an excellent job. As did the cinematographer, Jan DeBont. That has some of the best cinematography, and it's directed by John McTiernan, I might add, who, who is sorely missed that he hasn't done films in a long time. Um, you talk about my supporting characters. You said, well, maybe this one's okay, and this one, and this one. And you listed like three or four more. But then you only listed three or four years that were memorable either. There are so many forgettable, well, not forgettable, but not as fleshed out characters in Raiders of the Lost Ark as well. And I, I think the characters in Die Hard are just as memorable. No, no the, the Holly Gennaro character is such a weak female portrayal in film. And that was a very problematic part of the 80s. They made it all these damsels in distress, and they had to be saved by a big, strong man. Where in Raiders... Uh, Marion was able to take care of herself. Um, it was showing a strong character. She was right up there with Indy. They were doing things together. It wasn't anything where he had to save her, um, bar none. He he had to to rescue her, but she was not un, un um, 
you know, incapable of rescuing herself. And, and Holly just did not have that. I'm saying that, that the, the, the main cast of Raiders, the, the, the actual character portrayals are stronger performances. Um, John McClane is a good everyman, and then they just made him worse as they got on. But he's a great everyman in that movie. But Indiana Jones is an action star. You know, he's swinging from vines. He's swinging from that whip. He's kicking ass. And forget a, a sword fight. He's just going to shoot you in the neck and just be done with it. John McClane is the great everyman, and you said it yourself, because action films up until then were all this unstoppable juggernaut, you know, and, and Cobra and Raw Deal and all these Schwarzenegger Sloan films. Die Hard redefined the action movies for years, if not decades to come. And we're not talking about the sequels now. Did, did, did they get lesser as they went on? Possibly, even though I like most of them. But Die Hard itself is the gold standard, and it, like I said, it just redefined movies because everyone tried to imitate it because they liked this everyman action star. It was somebody they could relate to. It didn't need to be, you know, the the, the movie star because you don't want to think about the movie star. You want to think about the character in the film. I just, I, I still feel that Raiders has stronger action set pieces. There, there are not many memorable scenes from from Die Hard other than jumping out attached to a fire hose that would have snapped his back in half. All right, and that's time. Okay, two great movies we've debated here, and um, we're going to wrap it up here, starting with... Uh, James, we'll start with you and your closing comments. Look, Raiders of the Lost Ark, directed by Steven Spielberg, is one of the greatest films of all time. It's nonstop action from beginning to end. Whether he wants to just portray it as an adventure movie, I completely disagree. It's action after action after action, but it has so much more than just that. It's not just standard 80s action. It gives you the adventure, like he said, but it also gives you mystery and intrigue, and it gives you some sci-fi elementals and really, really creative villains. It's not just, oh, a terrorist is trying to take over a building. And you say that your movie is original, but it was done with Towering Inferno, very similar with, oh, guy, and guy in the skyscraper, things are happening. It's Towering Inferno minus the fire, and you add in terrorists. Uh, Raiders is, is a much more well-rounded film. It's not just one note of action after action after action. It gives you different elements, different genres, and a very compact, tight film. All right. Very good. And uh, Brian, we'll let you come back with your one minute for Die Hard. To say that Die Hard was like Tower Inferno just because they were up in big towers is just is is just silly. They have nothing to do with each other. And if you want to talk about originality, let's talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark, which it, it acknowledges completely. It's based on all the serials of like the 30s and 40s. So we're not going to start doing the originality argument. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is that Die Hard, it, it, it is a great action movie, but it's also quintessential 80s action movie, which is the question here. It's definitively 80s. It's got the one-liners, check. It's got the, you know, the sidekick in, in Al Powell, check. It's got the bumbling, you know, authority figures with, with the reporter and in the FBI agents, check. It is definitely an 80s movie, and that's the question here is what is the best 80s action movie? And, but most of all, an action movie is defined by its villain, largely. And Hans Gruber is just the greatest villain in movie history, in my opinion. And while Belloc is interesting, he's nowhere near the villain that Alan Rickman was. All right. Okay. That is the final arguments for uh, Die Hard versus Raiders of the Lost Ark. Two great movies, two great action movies, two great movies of the 80s. And uh, now it's time to decide which one was the better action movie. Uh, I'll take the lead on this one. I'll go first. Uh, both... I mean, you couldn't have picked two better. Uh, Brian, your answer was the first one I saw. I saw Die Hard, and I wondered how they were going to go up against that, and then I saw Raiders. I said, okay, we've got to fight on our hands. Uh, and, uh, Brian, you gave some great uh, great arguments for, for Die Hard, the cinematography, uh, the villain. Uh, it's a great movie. Uh, but James um, threw a lot at you. Uh, I mean, I liked how he focused on Marion and what a strong character, female character she was, uh, which, you know, we didn't get a lot of back then. Uh, the action set pieces, the scores, uh, the characters, uh, more memorable characters. Uh, so I, I feel like Raiders was the underdog here, but I'm giving James the point for uh, Raiders over Die Hard. Uh, Dan, we'll go to you next. What do you think? I'll tell you what. Um... When I heard the choices, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I was kind of surprised that these guys didn't go with different movies. But um, like Kirk said, I thought um, James James was the underdog. 
but the way he kept adding on best score, best char uh, supporting characters, all the different set pieces, Steven Spielberg's direction. Not only is it an adventure, but it's also an action film. And and he was attacking um, Brian on, on, on all of his points. And yet he kept on making his points and enforcing his own points. And I, I have to give uh, I have to give my point for uh, James. He definitely uh, earned earned it on this one. All right, James gets his point, which means he stays alive. And we are now moving on officially to the speed round. Uh, we have two questions. If uh, James, if Brian wins this first question, he'll win the match. If James ties it up, we'll go to our second speed round question. Uh, before I give you the question, the rules for the first speed round, uh, first phase of the speed round. Uh, you'll be given a question with two options. Uh, whoever ta whoever speaks first gets the first choice. So the person has to defend the uh, remaining option. Uh, person who guesses first will go first. And you get a 30-second opening. Uh, your opponent will get a 30-second opening, and then you both get 15-second closing. So uh, we will go with our first speed round question. Question near and dear to my heart. And again, uh, shout out your answer. Whoever gets it first gets, gets their pick. Which is the better movie? The Godfather or The Godfather Part 2? Godfather Part 2. Okay, James is taking Godfather 2, which means Brian will have to defend Godfather 1. Uh, James, we'll start whenever you start talking. Uh, we'll begin your 30-second timer. The Godfather Part 2 does almost the impossible. It takes a fantastic movie and it makes it better. It gets more in-depth with what these characters and their backstories. You see Michael go from this this reluctant um, uh, person coming back from the war to taking over and just elevating and becoming this ruthless, ruthless family leader. Um, the, the Robert De Niro stuff in the past is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's great seeing Robert De Niro on screen at the same time as you see um, Marlon Brando and you see Al Pacino. All three of them just elevate this movie to higher than what they are. And Godfather time. Movie. That's your 30 seconds. Uh, Brian, go ahead. You have 30 seconds for Godfather 1. So a lot of people will tell you that Godfather 2 is the better film. But the, but the fact is that the Godfather 2 couldn't exist without the Godfather 1. I mean, the Godfather 1 had established this character that you love that made you want to know more about them. It established this world that, that drew you in, that got everyone interested. It was it, it won Best Picture, but not based on characters that already existed, but based on characters that it created, that, well, that, that it introduced you to in this first film. So, so the second film could not have built on anything or made you more interested in them unless that first one was a great film on its own and could, could make you care about these characters and want to see more about them. And that's time. Okay, 15-second uh, follow-up to that. Uh, James, whenever you're ready. Yes, The Godfather established characters and won Best Picture. And then The Godfather Part Two elaborated on those characters and made them more interesting, and it also won Best Picture. To do that back-to-back -back is almost impossible. You never see sequels win Best Picture. You never see sequels that are just as good, if not as better, as the first and movie. Time. This movie is just as good, if not better. That's time. All right, and uh, Brian, your 15-second closing for Godfather. If you're asking which is the better film, you have to be looking at the film as a single film. And Godfather 2, as a single film, if you watch it and never saw Godfather 1, you would not be as interested in it. You would not enjoy it as much because it needs that first film to have characters to build on. The Godfather 1, by itself, as a movie, if there was never any sequels, would still have been a great film that everyone would have acclaimed just as and much. And time. All I right, okay, we'll go to... <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to the judges. Uh, Dan, we'll start out with you on this one. Uh, who's who's getting the point? I'll tell you what, that first salvo by James doing all the different things, bringing up all the different names, bringing up uh, so many different impossible, uh, impossible to um, do uh, overtake the first one. Um, ruthless leader, De Niro, great in the past. Um, you know, both, you know, attacking Brian's, uh, him saying that Godfather won the best picture. Well, Godfather 2 won the best picture. And um, all the different, going back from the future to the past, um, I think that really was enough for me to pick uh, James over Brian. Uh, he, he really gave me a lot in that first opening salvo. So that was my uh, choice, James. All right, Max, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with Dan. I think uh, James had the better um, 
uh, arguments compared to Brian's. Uh, the Godfather 2 is a very good movie, but uh, the way he presented The Godfather 2 in such a short little time uh, really sold me. Whereas Brian said, well, uh, The Godfather 2 couldn't exist without The Godfather 1, but didn't really explain why it was a better movie compared to what James uh, said. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. I think personally, I think Godfather is a better movie, but I think James focused more on the movie itself, uh, whereas Brian's focus was on how it established everything, set the groundwork. Um, so yeah, I would give the point to James as well. So here's where we stand, folks. James has come back down from two nothing to tie it up two two. So it all come down to the final question, and the timing would it be for any different. Right? <laughs> it couldn't be any different. It couldn't be different. No, it has to come down to the tiebreaker. Okay. <laughs> so, for the for the final question, uh, you will have a thirty second opening, a twenty second rebuttal, and a ten second closing. So you get three three opportunities to speak with this final question. And same rules: whoever answers first gets their choice and gets to uh, go first. So our final question for the evening that will decide the match: Who gives the better performance, Josh Brolin as Thanos? Or Michael Fassbender as Magneto? Josh Brolin. Fassbender. Okay. All right. Brian's going to start us off with 30 seconds on, uh, you said, which one did you pick, Brian? I'm sorry. I said Josh Brolin as Thanos. Okay. All right. Give us give us 30 seconds on Thanos. Okay. Josh Brolin took a character that could have been, very easily been a two-dimensional cookie-cutter character, especially being done in CG. Uh, as comic book villains are, and, and made gave him depth, just his emotion, and and not only with his motion capture through his face, but through his voice, and 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 he had to act through a, a CG character. But he, still, he gave you the character, the gravitas. He gave you his motivation. He gave him heart. He gave him emotion. He made you care about, not not sympathize with him, but understand where his motivation was coming from. And that it was a great performance because it made you understand the character. And time. Perfect timing. James, give us your 30-second opening for Fassbender as Magneto. See, I don't think that Josh Brolin was able to get the emotion that, that Fassbender does. Josh Brolin has, has CGI helping out his performance there. Fassbender has to do everything himself. There's no CGI. It's all his facial expressions. It's all his delivery. And he's able to give you his dark backstory, a Holocaust survivor that has to come up and, and realize that he needs to take matters into his own hand. He's He's been tortured, he's been doing, um, his family's been been killed. He has to come through and take matters into his own hands. And and just uh, what, what Thanos has done, it's, it's time. one. Brian, you get a 20 second rebuttal. Okay, again, I can't really knock Fassbender's performance because yes, he's a fabulous actor and did a great job in that movie. But especially as the different films went on, he took a character and, and, and he kind of became the same character over and over again. Whereas Thanos, he so far has had one movie essentially, not counting cameos, to create this character. And yes, CGI may have helped with physicality, but didn't help his performance. That's the whole point. It's just in his voice and in the way his performance was uh, non-physically understood. James, 20-second rebuttal. Yes, you've had one movie that way he hasn't screwed it up. Fassbender did fantastic in that first movie, did fantastic in that second movie, the third movie we're going to throw away. But what he was able to portray in those first two movies is fantastic. Thanos has been around in one movie. He was okay. It wasn't that great. I didn't get the, the heart that I got out of Fassbender. Fassbender had to do so much more physically and give you his backstory. And what, what Thanos has, has done and so time. far has been the average. That's time. Okay, guys, it's been a good debate so far. It all is going to come down to this, our final 10-second closing. Uh, Brian, we'll start with you, 10 seconds on Thanos. Okay, a good performance can convey a lot to you with the least words. He doesn't need a lot of so many big speeches and stuff. But you can sympathize with the character. You can understand his motivation. You can sympathize. You knew where he was coming from, and all because of just the emotion and things that he put into the and film. And time. Okay, James, you got 10 seconds to close us out. Your final thoughts on uh, Magneto. Fassbender had to live up to Ian McKellen, which is an impossible task, and he did it. He did it successfully. He did it with heart. Thanos has been a regular character. He just came in. 
He's done green screen work. He's done CGI work, and it's been absolutely just muddled. It's boring. It's and nothing. time. Whew. Okay, guys. I know judges. I know about the rest of you, but I think uh, they definitely saved the best for last. Uh, this one's. It's, I think out of all the fights we've had tonight, this might be the most even for me. So I'm going to need me to collect my thoughts. Max, I'll go to you. I'll let you start. Who are you giving your point um, to? Okay. This is very hard because uh, I believe that both uh, gave very strong arguments about uh, their respective characters. Um, in my personal opinion, I think that Thanos is a better villain. But I will give the point to James because he really explained – uh, himself more um, how uh, well developed Magneto was uh, as a villain compared to what Brian said about uh, Thanos. You know, uh, he said, you know, it's not just because he's CGI that he's good, uh, that he has this, this backstory of the concentration camps where his uh, parents were killed. Uh, so I think it was a, a much better argument uh, when I heard, you know, that he had more development. We saw more development out of Magneto than with uh, Thanos. So. Yeah. Okay. That is one for James. And uh, Dan, we'll go to you next. Magneto or Thanos, which way are you leaning? I'll tell you what. Um, I really liked, and this is the thing that really put it over the top for me. The last point, the last thing that James said, Michael Fassbender had to live up to Ian McKellen, and then still take that iconic character of Magneto and do his own thing with it, and he did. He 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 said how he brought emotion and he brought all this um, different different uh, things to the character that, and then that he attacked. He just kept on attacking that. It Thanos is a CGI character. There, there isn't a lot of real emotion. There isn't a lot of uh, acting there where Fassbender had to do it himself. It was him that you saw on screen. So I hate to do it to you, Brian. I have to give it to um, James. I hear you, Dan. Yeah, I think that uh, that the, the Ian McKellen uh, uh, mentioned at the end there was the knockout blow. Uh, that really put him over the top for me. I would have given the point to James as well. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Our winner coming back from a 2 nothing deficit to win. It is James the Gator White improving to 2-0. and James, how you feeling on this big win tonight, buddy? Dude, I'm just so happy to finally put a loss under Brian's name for something. <laughs> 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 um, uh, all cards on the table. I picked Die Hard first, and I also picked Mickey Rooney first. <laughs> so, so Brian had his votes in, and I was like, shit. I was like, I got to come up with backups for all of these. So just to get one point out of that uh, that first three questions, I was just happy. I thought I was actually going to be able to do it with Fisher Stevens. I thought he was going to nail me with Die Hard, but I was able to to figure out a way for for myself to, to win with Raiders. But um, you never know what's going to happen in the speed round. So once I got, you know, a point, I was like, okay, well, let me get let me get tied up, and then we'll see where we go. You never know. And sure. dude, Brian is just such a tough competitor in everything, trivia, debate. Um, and it, it really hurts that we have similar brains because we just argue the same thing. <laughs> so I had to try to find some way to eke it out, and I was just lucky I got it today. Awesome. Well, congratulations on your win. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Go, over to, go over to Brian. Real heartbreaker tonight. You look like you were cruising, cruising there for a while. Uh, but James just turned it on there at the end. How are you feeling about this match? What are your thoughts? Well, I'll be honest. I kind of, I was kind of trying for a knockout before we got to the speed round because I know I wouldn't be good in the speed round, especially when the first question came up about Godfather. I will get a lot of hate. I'm not a Godfather fan. I respect them as well-made movies, but it's just not my kind of thing. So I've seen them once, like 20 years ago. I couldn't name you three characters in the movies. So I was just treading oh. water in that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't bash the movies. I don't think they're bad movies. They're just not for me. Um, sure. And then in the la and then in the final question with the Thanos versus Fastbender, it's one of those things where you want to get your answer in first. And as soon as I said it, I thought I should have gone the other way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, so I kind of knew I was going to lose it in the speed round. But I gotta respect James. I mean, he's he's a great competitor. He did great, and he was working at a disadvantage because, like you said, I got my votes or my my choices in first, my answers, and he and he told me he also wanted uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. He also wanted Die Hard. He also wanted Christopher McQuarrie for his director. So he had to go and now. now Granted, I did offer to give up at least one or two of those. You did. He, he he turned me down, 
which is fine. But he found a way to win it anyway, so I got to give him extra credit just for that because with his second choices, he still he still beat me. Well, it's a great match for both of you. Very close. I'll go to my judges real quick. Dan, uh, what are your thoughts overall on the match? I'll tell you what. Um, these guys, I knew. You know, I knew coming into this match, this is going to be a slugfest because I know these guys. I've watched them play trivia. I've I've even had them judge my match. I knew that their brains. I knew how they were, they thought. And when I started seeing the choices come out of the different questions and and the way they were uh, picking choices and the in uh, their arguments, I was like, wow, these guys are going to really make it hard for me uh, to to pick. But it was easier than I thought. <laughs> but I just thought these guys were uh, fantastic and. Uh, I hope all the matches are like this, and, and I was glad to be a, a part of this match. These guys were fantastic. Absolutely. Max, how are you feeling? It was a very good match. Uh, congratulations, James. Uh, a pretty good uh, comeback. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was nice to see. I really enjoyed it. So it was a very, uh, like I said, very strong match, very, uh, very interesting. Uh, it was my first time uh, judging such a really, uh, really strong match like this. We both did a great job, and uh, our competitors, congratulations to you both. Before we go, uh, James, anything uh, you have you want to plug, anywhere we can find you on social media, anything you got going on? Uh, yeah, actually, I just started writing some reviews for um, my buddy Brandon Hanna's blog. You can find that at thelordsoffilm.com. Um, and then you can find me on Twitter, on Letterboxd, on Instagram. Yeah, that's, I think, it. Twitter, Letterbox, Instagram at Gator24. That's G4 T O R 24. Um, you'll see my reviews, my ratings, all that good stuff. And awesome. That's about it. Brian, how about you? What do you got for us? Uh, well, you know, I'm on Facebook. I'm under my name, Brian Michaels. If you use Letterboxd, I'm under uh, the name Cinemaphile. I do all kinds of reviews and lists and keep diary things on on there. Um, You'll find me competing in all the different trivia leagues around here. I'm also one of the uh, showrunners slash head question writer slash sometimes hosts at uh, Multiplex for Movie Warzone, which we're uh, starting up our team tournament soon, and there'll be a single tournament coming right following that. Um, that's about it. Fantastic. Uh, Max, what about you? Where we find you at, buddy? You can find, you can find me, sorry. You can find me on YouTube, Letterboxd, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Stardust, all these good places. Just look at my name, and you'll probably find me. <laughs> All right. We'll look for you, Dan. How about you? Where are you at? He's the only Max since Vincent. If you can't find him, you're not looking. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I love this kid. I mean, Max and I go way back. Uh, you can find me <laughs> found on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest, or at from the fourth row at WordPress.com, where I write about movies, or the website I work for called Cine Sports Talk. Dot com. That's C-I-N-E-S-P-O-R-T-S dot com. And I write about sports and movies. Fantastic. All right, guys, I'm Kirk Kolkowski. You can find me on Letterboxd at Kirk Kowal. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for my competitors. Thank you, my judges. We had a great match tonight. Uh, good time had by all. Um, good job, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>